Welcome to the Missional Life. This is a four-week course on evangelism that we designed at the Oasis, especially for us. My story is that I've been through a half dozen evangelism courses over the years, and I have certificates after certificate after certificate of taking courses just like this. The problem is that most of those courses are designed to teach people how to memorize a presentation or learn how to share a gospel tract with complete strangers. And the reality is nobody really keeps doing that after the 13-week course is over. I mean, some people do it for a month or two and some people for four or five months. But a year later, no one adopts that as a lifestyle. Going to people's houses, knocking on their doors, um, sharing a canned presentation with complete strangers, it just isn't natural. So after going through a number of evangelism courses, some of which had good stuff in them, I decided to make one especially for Oasis, one that fits our culture and our values and helps us to share our faith in a way that is unique and natural for us. So that's my story. And to really understand evangelism, one of the metaphors I want us to use in the course is the journey metaphor. The reality is that following Jesus is like following Jesus along a dirt path on a journey to Jerusalem. We're following Jesus. We're going where he's going. If you use that metaphor, then evangelism makes a lot of sense in a couple of ways. One way is It helps us understand what Jesus meant in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way. Jesus says, I am the way. One metaphor, I think, for understanding Jesus as the way is what I call the I-19 illustration. Let's look at that. So let's imagine this is Tucson and this is I-10. So this is I-19. And this is Mexico. Now, for the purposes of our illustration, Mexico is actually the kingdom of God. We'll just call it heaven. And I-19, for our purposes, is going to be the only way into heaven or Mexico. In reality, we know that there are several other roads that go across the border. But for our purposes, we're going to imagine only I-19 gets us to heaven. If that's the case, then I-19 is actually Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus says he is the way into the kingdom of heaven. Only Jesus ultimately leads to heaven. So then I-10 is really the church. In some sense, it's Christianity, at least the way we understand it. So, the church isn't the way into the kingdom of heaven. It's just the easiest access to Jesus. The truth is, you can be on I-10, in this case, the church, and be halfway to Los Angeles. It's not automatic that you're going to end up in the kingdom of heaven just because you're part of the church. But... If you go to a Bible-believing church, it's an easy way to get to Jesus. So, if Jesus is, in fact, the only way into heaven, then this illustration helps us understand a number of things. Uh, Number one, there are lots of roads that get to Jesus. Jesus may be the only way into heaven, but you can get to Jesus from, well, really anywhere. I mean, if you're up in... um, the Catalinas, halfway to Summerhaven, you can still turn around and get to Jesus. Or you could take the back road and end up in Catalina, but eventually find your way to Jesus. The reality is, it doesn't matter where you are, Los Angeles, Phoenix, it doesn't matter where you are, you can eventually get to Jesus from anywhere. Another thing we learned from this um, illustration is that not everyone is going to get to Jesus the same way. So maybe I'm over somewhere around Rita Ranch area. The reality is that from Rita Ranch, I could probably take Houghton or Rita to I-10 and eventually get onto I-19. But I also might go all the way down to Sarita Road and take Sarita Road all the way to Jesus. So 
regardless of where you are, you can get to Jesus, really, from anywhere. And not everyone is going to get to Jesus the same way, even if they start in the same place. And another takeaway from this illustration is that the direction that we're headed is really more important than the road we're on. So I could be a part of the church, but I could be all the way up past Phoenix on my way to L.A. headed toward California. That's much more dangerous than let's just imagine Islam for a moment um, crosses I-19 somewhere around here. It's possible that a person who's been a lifelong Muslim could actually be headed in the right direction toward Jesus. Now, they might not actually stay on this road. They might just cross paths and continue on. But in this sense, they're headed in the right direction, at least for a moment. Maybe they're learning about Isa, the prophet Isa. And maybe they're, they're talking to a follower of Jesus who's explaining that Isa is risen from the dead, that he's more than a prophet. That person has an opportunity to ultimately get to Jesus without going through the church. So the important thing about this illustration is Jesus is ultimately the path to heaven. Every one of us needs to ultimately get aboard Jesus and head south in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. No other road leads to heaven, but all roads ultimately can find their way to Jesus if we take the right directions. So number one in your manual is that we're all on a journey following Jesus along the way. All of us are on the same journey if we're Jesus followers. Now the people around us are on their own journey. If they're not yet Jesus followers, they're on a completely different journey from the one that we're on. We're following the narrow path. Now, the reality is following Jesus isn't like driving your car on I-19. It's more like a hike. Um, on a recent Sunday, I uh, referred to the Huashan Trail, which is like the most dangerous hike in the world in China. Following Jesus is more like the Huashan Trail, actually, than it is I-19. So imagine for a moment that you're following Jesus on this treacherous mountain hike. Other people's trails are all over the place, but sooner or later, they intersect with ours. In fact, number two is, as we go, our journey intersects with others. Let me show you what this looks like. So following Jesus, we're going on a treacherous trail through the mountains, headed to the kingdom of heaven. And other people are on a completely different trails that intersect ours. Each of these intersections is what I call evangelism. It's a conversation with a human being who crosses our path, but they're not on our path. They're not Jesus followers. Now, sometimes those people decide to travel with us for a moment. Maybe they're not yet committed to following Jesus, but they're willing to be a part of our home church. Or they're willing to have conversations with us on a regular basis about spiritual matters. Maybe even they come to the Sunday gathering for a few weeks. For a season at least, they follow us. Then at some point, maybe they head back to the trail they were on in the first place and decide this isn't for them. It doesn't matter that some of these people travel for just a short season and some of these people ultimately stay on the path and follow Jesus with us for a lifetime. We don't control whether or not people remain on the path or get off the path. That's between them and Jesus. We're not to take any responsibility for what they do with the good news. We're just responsible when our path intersects theirs that we love them. That we share our lives with them, that we, we have spiritual conversations, that we remain open to the Holy Spirit when he leads us to do so, to invite them to journey with us, at least for a moment. So I want us to look at evangelism simply as an intersection. We're on a journey following Jesus along the way. And from time to time, other people encounter us. And we simply say to them, would you like to join us? At least for a while. That's evangelism. That's all it is. If that's the case, it's also important how we see people. The people we intersect with. The people who don't know Jesus yet. Um, sometimes when, when I meet Christians who've been part of other traditions, they refer to non-believers in ways that can be disparaging. I jokingly refer to my friends who aren't Christians as pagans. But I say that lightly and I say that in a fun way. 
The reality is I don't refer to them as pagans. They might find that offensive. Now, those who are neo-pagans who practice Wicca actually aren't bothered by that term at all. But one of the most disparaging terms that I hear as a believer about non-believers is lost. Now, it's okay to say that someone is a non-Christian or a non-believer, but to say that someone is lost is actually an attack. Number three, I wrote here, it matters how we see people. Are they lost or, here's my word, missing persons? I prefer missing persons. Now, a lot of times people will defend calling non-believers lost by saying, well, that's what the Bible calls them. And they'll refer to a passage like the one I have here, Luke 19.10, which says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And they say, see, Jesus refers to them as lost. The truth is, the word lost in Greek could also be translated as missing. And missing is a lot less negative and hostile than lost. And it, it, it's equally um, valid as a translation, lost or missing. Um, this really hit home, hits home for me um, because I was on a hike a few years ago, and many of you know the story. I was on a hike, and uh, I had had lunch with Rod. And Rod and I were talking, and he said, so what are you going to do today? I said, you know what? I think I'm in the mood to go on a hike. He's like, like that? I was in, I think, shorts and a t-shirt. And I said, yeah, I plan on going straight up to Mount Lemmon and doing seven cataracts. And he said, dude, it's monsoon season. you got to prepare better than that. And I said, ah, I'll be fine. So I went by myself against uh, his advisement. I drove to seven cataracts, and then I, I looked across the overlook, and I saw the waterfalls. And I thought, wow, seven cataracts. That's beautiful. I'm going to do seven cataracts. I'm going to do it right now while the water is falling. Well, there's no actual trailhead to get to the foot of the falls. So I looked on my map and I realized that what people do is they actually drive to the overlook and then they scale down this like 80 degree incline down to the bottom of the canyon and the river's right there. In fact, you can almost look straight down at the river. Well, I'm definitely afraid of heights. So I didn't want to scale down um, to the river. I looked around. I looked around. I looked to see if maybe somewhere it was a 30 degree incline. No, nowhere. It was like almost straight down. So there was just no way I was going to do it. So I pulled out my maps. I looked at my maps and I realized that I could drive down uh, further uh, toward the bottom. And there's actually a place to park and hit a trailhead. And if you take that trail far enough, it eventually intersects the same river at the bottom of the falls several miles down. And I realized if I, if I intersect that river, instead of crossing the river, I can just follow the river upstream and eventually I'll be in the same place. So that's what I did. It was a much more sissy trail. So I took that route and because I went way out of my way, it actually took hours, hours to get to the foot of the falls. When I did, I started to climb up the mountain and realized that climbing up the other side was just as scary as climbing down the side I was on. So after trying for a few minutes, I realized I was too chicken to climb up the falls. So I went back to the bottom of the river and tried to figure out what to do next when suddenly the monsoon hit. And it's raining and I'm scrunched under a tree. There's thunder, there's lightning, and I'm just soaked and now I'm cold. I decided I need to call my wife because she would be worried and looked at my cell phone and it had no signal. I'm at the bottom of seven cataracts. I have nowhere I can go and I can't contact anyone and it's nightfall. I realized I could go back the way that I came, but I would run out of light and I would never make it back. The only way out was to scale the same mountain I refused to climb down in the first place. I eventually got up the courage to climb up the mountain and I just kept saying to myself, don't look down, don't look down, don't look down. But since it got dark, it was a lot easier not to look down. Eventually, I got to the top. I started walking along the road, still didn't have a signal. Eventually, called my wife, told her I was okay. And all of my family, all of my friends, everybody had heard that I was lost on the mountain. Everyone was praying for me. The sheriff was looking for me. But I was found. I was found. To this day, people will still say to me, when I tell them I'm going hiking, hey, you're going with somebody, right? I mean, you don't want to get lost like last time. You know what? I didn't get lost last time. I knew where I was. I was at the bottom of seven cataracts. I could show you on the map where I was when I was there. I was stuck. 
I was trapped in a monsoon. I had no cell signal, but I knew where I was. Look, my friends who don't know Jesus, they may not know that Jesus is looking for them. They may be happy and content where they are. They are missing persons, but they're not lost. The path they're on, they're aware of the path they're on. They've chosen that path. They're missing persons. Uh, I mentioned on um, this sheet of paper here, Luke 15. Luke 15 is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. It refers to a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. I prefer to say a missing sheep, a missing coin, and a missing son. Because in all three of those stories, we're really told by Jesus how God feels about people who don't know him. He misses them. He longs for them to come back. He looks for them. He searches for them. In the case of the the son, he waits for the son to come home. To change his mind. To decide that being with the father beats being away from the father. That's the heart of God. And that's the heart that I want us to have for missing persons. I want us to recognize that God loves them and that he wants us to join him in helping them to have a reunion. So what I wrote here, two lines. Every non-believer we intersect is missing, so Jesus misses them. Jesus misses them. He's actually waiting for them to come home. He's pursuing them. He's sending people like you and me into their lives to intersect their path so that we can love them into the kingdom. The second thing I wrote down is that every person we intersect is made in God's image, so Jesus loves them. Jesus cares about them. That's why he's pursuing them. I also like to say Jesus likes them. Because I've been told my whole life that Jesus loves everyone. I've been told by my parents since I was a kid I should love everyone, but I don't have to like everyone. And I don't. The reality is Jesus actually likes people we don't like. That we find it hard to love. He actually cares about them. So I want you to realize the people around you who are missing persons are on God's milk carton in the sky. He wants them back. And he is sending you and me out as a search team to love them back into the kingdom. Number four. We must assume that Jesus is at work in missing persons before we get there. I used to think that I was God's special agent and that oftentimes when I had a conversation with a missing person, I was the first person God was using to bring them into the kingdom. As I've grown older and wiser and had more conversations with people, I realized God's been pursuing people long before I knew them. In fact, long before they were even aware of who God is, God has been pursuing them. There's a stream, a current in every person's life of God pursuing them before they even knew him. Um, A story I told recently at the Oasis is um, a story about uh, a student that I used to meet with for coffee named, uh, we'll say Emily. And um, Emily was rough around the edges. Um, Her language wasn't Christian at all. Uh, She didn't know Jesus, and she acted like it. And she was really hostile to a lot of spiritual things, and yet she was willing to have coffee with me and talk about spiritual matters. So I knew God was at work in her life. I just didn't know where. So I would ask her questions, and I discovered her mom uh, was a hyper-fanatic religious person that kind of turned her off. Her dad was not in the picture. She was being raised by a single mom, and her mom used religion uh, to kind of beat her up. And she had taken her for a while to a large church to a youth program, but the youth program had turned her off in some way. Someone had been hurtful to her. So she had religious burn, church burn, mom burn, all that. Um, but as I, as I asked her questions and got to know her, I realized she had this uncle who lived in Phoenix that she just loved. And he would come down to Tucson just to spend time with her. And she would look forward to his visits. And then she one day told me that he was a follower of Jesus. He was a believer. And so he was this kind-hearted man that God had put into her life and had been using in her life for decades to love her into the kingdom. The reality is God's at work in people's lives before you get there, before I get there. We just want to be a part of what God is already doing to woo and pursue and love these people back to him. We're partners with God. We're not doing his job. Number five, we should expect missing persons to act like missing persons. Um, 
I like to fondly say that if Taylor Swift were to write this, it would be sinners going to sin, 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 sin. That's what they do. We should expect that. It, it shouldn't be abnormal. I'm surprised that Christians are often offended by the humor of non-believers or by their politics or by their language or by their habits. Christians are often bothered by non-Christians acting like non-Christians. Folks, if I didn't know Jesus, you wouldn't like me very much. My language would be a lot more salty. My behavior would be a lot more immoral. If I didn't know Jesus, I would not be the person I am today. So it stands to reason that my friends who don't know Jesus probably act like they don't know Jesus. We should not be surprised. Um, I also mentioned recently on a Sunday morning about uh, a, a young man named Fred. At least that's the name I'm going to give him. Um, Fred will come to our crew meetings sometimes, but only the ones we have food. Whenever we have food, Fred is there. He finds out. He shows up. If we don't have food, Fred's not coming. Fred's not really interested in spiritual things at all right now. Fred is interested in food. So we, we had an event. Fred came. We're eating pizza. I look around, and Fred's there. No one's talking to Fred, and there are a lot more interesting people in the room. I've talked to Fred before. I don't like to talk to Fred, but Fred's alone, so I start talking to Fred. And I realize as I'm talking to Fred why I don't like to talk to Fred. Fred's conversation is kind of confrontational. He's kind of hostile about the faith. He's asking me really hard questions. He's negative about Christianity and the Bible. And I realize that his conversation is all about himself. All self-centered. I look at his face and I realize his glasses are all smudged and cracked. There's, there's dandruff all in his hair. Um, he's, he's not clean. He's socially awkward. But then I realized all of a sudden as I'm thinking about all these little things and the fact that he probably has an offensive odor, God just tells me, I love Fred. And I realize, of course, there's stuff in Fred's life that I find offensive. Of course, I'm not drawn to Fred. But God is. Fred is made in the image of God. God loves Fred and wants to draw Fred into the kingdom through me. So our first task, number six, is to fall in love with missing persons. God's already in love with the Freds of the world. And he's inviting you and me to fall in love with them too. But that requires us to, session one, see people. I just want to invite you tonight to really notice people to really pay attention to them to recognize what they're doing to just see the the person waiting your table in the restaurant to just notice the guy behind you at the gas station pumping his gas to simply open your eyes and realize the world is full of image bearers whom Jesus loves and is calling home I want to invite you to learn to do that. Because the reality is the people around us are going to hell and sometimes we act like we don't care. So where do you want to eat? Feels like an Arby's night. <laughs> Arby's beef and cheese and do you believe in God? Yes. Oh, so you're pretty religious. I try. <laughs> So is it a problem that I'm not really religious? Not for me. Why not? I'm not the one going to hell. <laughs> well, and they forgot to deliver your paper today. Why don't you uh, just grab that one? But that belongs to Mr. Potato Guy. That's his. Come on, I'll get it. Well, if you want it, you get it. Sorry, thou shalt not steal. Oh, but it's okay for me. Oh, what do you care? You know where you're going. All right, that is it. I can't live like this. Oh, no. Come on. All right, what did I do? David, I'm going to hell. The worst place in the world. With devils and those those caves and and the ragged clothing and the heat, my God, the heat! What do you think about all that? It's gonna be rough. Uh, you should be trying to save me. Don't boss me. 
This is why you're going to hell. I am not going to hell. And if you think I'm going to hell, you should care that I'm going to hell, even though I am not. You stole my Jesus fish, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Whenever I watch that video, it makes me laugh. But what doesn't make me laugh is that we're a lot like David Putty. The people around us are going to hell, and we don't care because we know where we're going. The reality is we do need to care about the people around us. We need to love people enough to care where they're going to spend eternity. They don't care because they don't appreciate the magnitude of separation from God. But we do. So we need to love them into the kingdom as far as it depends upon us. So at the, at the bottom here, I, I, I ask, what does that look like? What does it look like to love missing persons like God does? Uh, well, number one, let me give you some advice. Get to know people instead of trying to fix them. Too often I see this, even in home church, that we're trying to fix each other. We don't like the fact that we're broken. We don't want each other to stay broken. We want to put people back together, give them advice and patch them up. But that's God's job. It's God's job to put us back together. Our job is just to love people in our brokenness and to move them toward the healer. So learn to be a good listener. Just love people where they are. Don't try to fix them. Um, years ago, I had a couple of young ladies um, that attended my class. One came to one of my classes, and then later her sister came. And I didn't realize they were sisters at first. And when I found out, the younger sister who took me last um, told me the story of their whole family. Turns out their family had come from some new age church back east. Um, the, the parents had left the denomination and had started over a brand new religion with themselves as the lead prophets. And in their religion, they're the only people who can be prophets as long as they're alive. And they have this direct channel to God that no one else has. So we would talk about what their um, New Age religious services were like. And I didn't try to beat up on them. I didn't try to explain how that was all against the Bible. The reality is they don't follow the Bible. They follow other writings. They follow other people. So I just listened. I just wanted to love them and get to know them and understand where they were on their journey. And they appreciated that. And we would talk. And I remember one time they, they told me, I asked them, what do you guys do in your services? And they said, well, sometimes my parents will give a talk. Occasionally, they will actually, and they used a word I didn't understand. And they basically said, they'll actually do this thing. And I said, explain that. And they said, well, it's like channeling someone, uh, the spirit of someone who's deceased. And I said, so they channel other people? They said, oh yeah, they channel great religious leaders all the time. And they started listing off all these famous philosophers and religious people that their parents channeled. At one point, I don't know what possessed me, but at some point I finally said, have they ever channeled Jesus? And they paused and they got real quiet because they knew where I was coming from. And they said, as a matter of fact, they have channeled Jesus. And I said, really? Wow. Wow. And then they asked me a question I had wished they did not ask. They said, do you, do you agree with that? What do you think? What do you think about the fact that our parents channel Jesus? And I thought about it very carefully. And I said, you know what? Um, I believe that your parents believe that they channel Jesus. I just don't believe it's actually Jesus. I think it's an imposter, an imposter spirit. I said, does that make sense? And they said, sure. We actually have imposter spirits all the time, and we have to tell people to stop channeling those spirits. I said, really? Well, it's kind of like that. I just can't believe your parents channel Jesus, but I believe that they believe it. I don't believe they're deceiving you. I don't believe they're misleading you. I mean, they're your parents. They love you. I believe they're being as honest with you as they know how. To which they responded, wow, we have fundamentalist Christian uh, relatives back in California that think we're terrible and that we're all going to hell and that we're making all this stuff up. Even though you don't believe that our parents are channeling Jesus when they claim they are, we actually are happy to hear that you don't believe they're intentionally being deceitful. Because no one in our family who claims to be a Christian sees things that way. Well, you know what? My job's not to fix them. My job's to love them where they are. And that's what we're supposed to do is just try to understand people 
not try to fix people. Number two, develop trust by becoming the person who really listens and cares. Todd Hunter uh, used to be the president of Alpha USA, and I had a chance to visit with him a few years ago in Green Valley. And at the end of the night, we're standing out in a driveway, getting ready to part ways and get in our cars and drive home. And Todd Hunter said to me, he said, uh, you know, one of the things that I do is I ask non-Christians how they view Christians. And the number one answer I hear is Christians don't listen. Christians don't listen well. That feels true. I've talked to a lot of Christians and I don't think they listen well at all. I can only imagine what it would be like to be a non-believer talking to them, to be a missing person. We think that evangelism is primarily telling people stuff, but I want you to change your view right now about evangelism. The title of this session is See People. The first and most important stage of evangelism, because nothing else matters if you don't see people, is that people matter to God, and the way they matter to you, they know that they matter to you, is that you listen to them, that you care. So learn to just be quiet. Learn to just shut up. Learn to ask questions and sit in the silence and let people tell you what's going on in their lives. Uh, years ago, I had a friend named Andy. Um, I met Andy shortly after I got to Tucson and joined a civic club uh, just to meet non-believers like, like Andy. And one day after one of our meetings, Andy said to me, hey, I'm going to go home and watch the Diamondbacks game. Would you like to come over and have a beer? I said, sure. Now, the reality is I wasn't going to watch that game. I care about sports as much as anybody. I like the Diamondbacks, but I don't watch a lot of baseball during the regular season. And I had never had a beer, not an entire beer at that time. So I didn't care about that stuff, but Andy cared about that stuff. So I went over to his house just to spend time with him and have a beer. It was, um, it was terrible beer. It was like a Budweiser. It was just a skanky beer. I couldn't even drink it. But I nursed that beer for an hour and a half while I talked to Andy about stuff that mattered to Andy. That's what I mean. Which um, leads me to three and four. Number three is be real. Offer your heart to those around you. Just be real with people. Um, the reality is, if you seem too good to be true, you're going to be a turn off to non-believers. They want to know that you're real and that you make mistakes and that you struggle and that life is hard. And the reality is, you're just like them. You just have Jesus. You're just as messy. You're just as broken. You just have Jesus. So be authentic with people. Years ago, I would uh, spend time with a friend. I'll just call his, him John. Uh, I met John at that same civic club early on after moving to Tucson. And John and I would go to a lot of games, football games, basketball games. I would often drive to his house, pick him up. We'd go to the game, come back, and we would sit in his driveway in my car and talk for an hour before he would go inside. And we talked about everything. And I told him about my real struggles in life, the things that I w the stuff that I was going through and struggling with, my fears, my worries. He knew that Jesus is the person I turned to. But he also knew that I had the same kinds of struggles in life that he did. And that matters to people. Number four, talk about stuff that matters to the other person. These are what Christians call middle issues. I got this from a book called The Celtic Way of Evangelism, which is about St. Patrick. Middle issues are not first or tertiary. Primary or first issues are life and death, heaven and hell. Jesus, religion, that kind of stuff. Those are primary issues. When you start talking about primary issues, people get nervous. Tertiary issues, number three, third issues, issues that don't really matter that much are the diamondbacks, the wildcats, the weather, stuff that is not really important. Most people live in the middle. What they care about is their marriage, their finances, their job, their children. They're not over here dealing with the stuff that matters most. They're not really thinking a lot about that stuff. But they're also not consumed with stuff that doesn't matter. They might spend a lot of time watching TV and playing on the internet. But at the end of the day, they care about their family. Learn to hang out with people and talk about middle issues. The other day I went to uh, coffee with a, with, a, with a guy who's been coming to our church for a while. Um, we'll just say uh, that his name is um, Ed. 
And so Ed and I are sitting outside at a coffee shop, and we're just talking about life. And Ed told me about his, his business. He told me about his finances. And so for a while, we just talked about our finances, mine and his and our principles and how we live. And for a while, he talked about his marriage, and we just talked about marriage. And for a while, he talked about his kids because he cares about his kids. And he told me the whole story of his kids and some of the worries he has about his kids. And we just talked, and I just listened. I spent probably two hours talking to Ed about middle issues because I want to get to know Ed. And that's where Ed lives. So be okay talking about middle issues. We can't always talk about church. We can't always talk about God. We can't always talk about heaven and hell. The reality is middle issues are the practical places that people actually live. So talk about the stuff that matters to them. All right, Oasis, I'd like to go over your assignment for the week and your activity to do right now. Um, if you'll flip over to the next page, you'll see a developing an impact list. I want you to take the next 10, 15 minutes, however long it takes in your home church, to fill this out. First, you're going to come up with your relational networks. Now, I've given you some examples of networks, but you can come up with your own. Maybe you go to the gym a couple times a week. Maybe there's a restaurant or a coffee shop you frequent regularly. Uh, maybe you're involved in a homeowners association. All of you have neighbors wherever you live. If you go to work or school, you have either classmates or, or work associates. So I want you to think about all the networks that you have. Where do you know people? What are the people groups you're in? And again, you might not know people's first names, and that's okay. You may not know if they're believers or not. Again, that doesn't matter. For the sake of this first part, you just want to identify where you know people. The second part would be your interests. These are the kinds of things you can do with people when you try to get to know them. When you want to develop a friendship with someone, you want to spend time doing stuff with them you're already doing, stuff you already intend to do that you enjoy doing. And again, these are just some ideas here. Write down your own interests. What do you do for fun? Do you eat? I mean, you probably eat. If you like to eat out, you can do that with someone. The last part is for you to put your missing friends. And I want you to put as many people on here as you can think of. These are people that, as far as you know, don't know Jesus. Again, you may not know because you haven't had a spiritual conversation with that person yet. Put them down anyway. If you put them down now and assume they don't believe, later on you can mark them off. And in some cases, you may not even know their first name. You can put the dude with the long sideburns who works on Thursdays at my coffee shop. You know, put that down. List as many people as you can. If you know their name, great. If you don't, that's okay too. Put something down that lets you know you know who you're talking about. Now, here's the important part, and this is the actual homework assignment that you're going to do for this next week. At the bottom, it says, these are the three or more people I would like to invite to Easter Sunday. Now, you don't have to do that part right now in home church. You can do that part for homework. But I want you to come up with, this week, the names of three people that you are going to invite to come with you to Easter services. Now, they may not come. They may all three tell you no. That's okay. You're not worried about it. You're not even going to invite them this week or even next week. You're just going to come up with the names of three people you could invite. Three people that are either unchurched believers or unchurched non-believers. List three names here. Again, you don't have to do that right now in home church, but that's your assignment for the week is to come up with three people you can invite to Easter Sunday services, which, by the way, are coming up on April the 12th this year at Oasis. So list out three names. That's it. That's your homework assignment. And when you get finished with this activity a few moments, I want you to take time to pray for your missing friends. And once you've done the impact list and prayed for your friends in a pair with another person in your home church, you're done. Home church leaders, please don't stop this activity until everyone has been through all three parts. Feel free to rotate around since you've already done this and help people to make sure they've got names at the bottom. And then if you guys have a Facebook group or any kind of online thread, I challenge you to share with the other members of your home church who the three people are that you've come up with this week that you're going to invite to Easter services. Home church leaders, please follow up with everyone in your home church this week 
before your next meeting and make sure everybody has three names.